everybody. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Karen Tucker. Tonight, Churchill Club presents Wael Gonim in conversation with Laura Seidel. Wael has a new book called Revolution 2.0, and it's a memoir about his experiences and his part in a remarkable movement that resulted in revolution in Egypt and beyond. Welcome, Weil and Laura. Thank you very much for being with us. <laughs> Underwriting for this program has been provided by Google. Let's also express our thanks for their support. Photographs and videotaping are not permitted this evening. We appreciate your understanding and cooperation. This program will be aired on KQED FM radio on Sunday, February 12 at 3 p.m. It will be available simultaneously via kqed.org and TuneIn Radio at tunein.com. A word about the Churchill Club, a not-for-profit now 26 years young and 7,000 members strong. We are devoted to encouraging innovation and economic and societal growth. You can learn more at churchillclub.org. And finally, if you are tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club. Let us now welcome our moderator. Laura Seidel is the digital culture correspondent for National Public Radio. In her reporting, she examines how <coughs> new technologies are transforming the world around us she did a piece last summer investigating the hoarding of software patents by so-called patent trolls and how that impacts innovation. It aired on This American Life, and it was the most downloaded podcast in the show's history. So now she has to top her own record. Please welcome Laura Seidel. Well, we're not going to talk about software patents. Um, while Gonam was born in Cairo and grew up in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, he earned a computer science degree from Cairo University in 2004 and an MBA from American University in Cairo in 2007. He joined Google in 2008, rising to become head of marketing for Google Middle East and North Africa. And he's currently on a sabbatical from Google to launch an NGO supporting education and technology in Egypt. Welcome. Thanks. So uh, I'm happy to be here. We're happy to have you and um, to talk a little bit about the journey that, that got you um, from sort of a quiet uh, computer science engineering student, an MBA, a marketing person to this stage here talking to us. Um, I, I guess I do want to ask you, how did a nice boy like you get mixed up in a revolution? <laughs> You know, in most ways, you were really, you were more or less a part of Egypt's more privi privileged class. Um, you were well-educated. You had an excellent job with the great American company, you know, wife, children, all those good things. Uh, and somehow, you got pulled in. What happened? I think it was not just about me. It was about uh, many young Egyptians uh, who were pretty much frustrated from what is going on in the country, uh, thinking that, uh, you know, it's enough. It, you know, injustice, dictatorship, um, the regime was aggressively dealing with all the opponents and people violating the human rights, and uh, we just felt that that was it. Uh, when Mohammed al um he's a Nobel Prize winner, he used to work in the international um, you know, this thing that deals with nuclear weapons, I forgot its name. Um, <laughs> it's okay. The International Agency of Atomic, I mean, I'm missing one thing. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Uh, so uh, he, was, um, he was basically a catalyst for change for many Egyptians, and we started thinking that they, you know, listen, there, there might be an alternative for us, um, and why don't we go behind the guy and support him, and again, that wasn't just one or two or three or ten people or thousands uh, of Egyptians. In fact, his page uh, got like 250,000 people at the time supporting his nomination as a president and calling for change. Um, so it, it happened unintentionally. It happened, um, there wasn't like a conscious decision 
or a strategy layouting that, you know, okay, now I'm going to get into politics and here's the plan, here's what I'm going to do. No, it was just coincidence, you know, coincidental. Yeah, and you were actually involved in setting up a page to support him. Was that sort of quietly in the background you were, you were involved in that? Yeah, I mean, when, uh, when there was this, uh, that group that was created by the fans in order to uh, support him, I thought of, I should create his official page. Um, and uh, the fact is, I, I know how to use Facebook pretty much because of the fact that I, I, <laughs> I work at Google. Um, and everybody uh, at Google knows how to use <laughs> Facebook. Yeah, and um, I just created the page hoping that as soon as, as, soon as it becomes uh, uh, become a bigger platform, it could be his platform to communicate with the young people on, uh, uh, on the internet. Uh, and it was a very funny experience because when I created the page, a lot of people were speaking to me when I write posts, which were basically his posts. Like I get newspaper, whatever he said in the newspaper and post it as, you know, his quotes. So people were communicating with me as if I was Al-Baradai. Uh, that, that was how official the page was. And I remember like some guys like, why are you on Facebook? <laughs> you know, don't you have other things to do? And uh, <laughs> that was, um, it was very, it was very important, uh, I learned through this experience, um, as well as the other administrator, there was another guy that I invited to join the page, we were po both anonymous, and I contacted his brother, uh, um, uh, and I just said, told him, you know, we have this page uh, for it, but it had at the time about 80,000, I believe, members, and he didn't really understand how important that page was, uh, but eventually I got even in contact with Al Baradei, uh, and I told them, whatever you guys want to have on this page, please, you know, you can even take it over. And things kept developing, as I, as I said. We just, I just found myself in, in the middle of, the, of this place. And I, I think it's it, really the thing, though, that got you even more deeply involved was the next page that you got involved with when a, a, a young Egyptian man was killed by the police. Yeah, like, I explained on the... On, on, my journey, I noticed that uh, the cause was kind of personalized uh, with Al-Baradei. It was, yes, it was change that we're all looking for, but it was kind of personalized to a, you know, single individual. And um, that did kind of hurt back because when you personalize the cause, people are questioning the intentions of the individual and uh, people are, you know, might agree or disagree with the individual uh, or, def you know, create a smear campaign to reduce the value of what he says. Um, but now I can sit down and analyze that and, and, and see it happening. I just remember one, one of his words is that if you think I am the savior, then you're probably not thinking the right way. The Egyptian people are the ones who will save themselves. Um, things kept developing until one uh, day I saw on Facebook a photo of a young man who looked like he was br brutally beaten up uh, and the reports say he's, he's dead. And um, I got very frustrated and angry and I broke into tears. I could not believe that someone would do this to an individual, you know, another, uh, a human would do that to another human being. And it wasn't just me, it was hundreds if not thousands of e young Egyptians who made the connection. There was a photo of a middle class young Egyptian who was brutally beaten up. And I thought at the time, what should I do? And um, and the thing, I mean, everybody knew, or, or so it was said that it was the police who had, who had beaten him. And yeah, it's not clear that there was a good reason for it, right? Uh, yeah, until today there, isn't, there are some speculations. But typically, one of the problems that we had in Egypt, that the police force was the right wing of the dictatorship, the right arm, not the right wing, the right arm of the dictatorship. I'm thinking chicken wings, sorry. <laughs> uh, the right arm of the dictatorship. and. They, their violations were sort of acceptable because they protect the regime and they, most of the time they're not held accountable. They, there have been torture cases where people died from torture while during the interrogations and pretty much they managed to hide the case and that's it. And I thought at the time probably the best way is to expose uh, their practices and I believe that the Worst thing a dictator wants is someone exposing. The worst thing any, anyone in this life wants when they are doing ba something bad is someone coming in and put the spotlight on it. 
And uh, that was pretty much my intention. I wanted to put the spotlight on their practices, hoping they would change, hoping they would listen. And, uh, uh, and particularly for Khaled Saeed's case, I was hoping the case become public. So I created a page, and in, in the first 24 hours, 36,000 people joined it. Um, and that was mainly because of the cause, not because of any of my skills. It was people looking for Googling or Facebooking his name and trying to understand uh, what was happening for the guy and how did he uh, die. And there was a huge amount of anger uh, among the young people because he could be easily any one of us. Mm -hmm. and, he, and I mean, over this period of time, it seems like he became, the police said he had, they were trying to arrest him, he'd swallowed marijuana, and it, yeah. it, it sort of Hash, became... we don't have marijuana. Either. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I gotta get my drug straight. And which, uh, country they come from. Um, <clears throat> well, we have a different style of marijuana, a bit cheaper. <laughs> I've never tried any of that, I have to say. I'll come visit <laughs> sometime. Um, so this, it began to grow and people, I mean, and you were doing this all anonymously. You were actually pretty careful. I don't even think, you were not even living in Egypt at the time, right? Yeah, I was living in Dubai and um, I invited the same administrator uh, of the other page. I was like, after the third day, 100,000 people joined the page. I was, I have to also work. I travel a lot. I need someone to definitely help. And I talked to the guy whom, by the way, I've never met in my life. Uh, was, our relationship was very was virtual. I knew his real name, and he knows my real name. So I invited him to join. And, uh, we were both keen that no one discovers our identity. One, for a very obvious reason. Um, do you mind if you can turn off this? Because the flash is kind of uh, the light. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, basically what happens one is, I don't want to personalize the cause. The cause is that someone have died, and everyone is related to that. It's not about Wa'il Ghunim or Abdurrahman Mansour or anyone. The real hero or the real you know, symbol is the cause, and everyone is connected to that. And the second, the obvious reason is you don't want to end up having state security uh, knocking the door because I, I used to travel to Egypt a lot, and I have family members in Egypt as well. And they have a good, by the way, history of when they can't find you, they get to your relatives, and, uh, and they use them as a way to get you. Um, and that happens to be one of the very important forces of driving the page. Probably I can talk about it now and you know, give, uh, um, give some wisdoms to it, uh, yet um, it was very critical. People were very happy that no one is taking credit. No one was, you know, uh, uh, was riding the wave. And uh, I remember I got a lot of questions. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And um, I wrote a note, said, who are you, Mr. Admin? And I made sort of a personal interview with myself. And it's, it's, I have the full thing on the book. So like when, how old are you? I say, I can't tell you. But I'll tell you one thing. I've, uh, I've only seen a single president since, each, since I was born. And, uh, <laughs> it, was a very, it was a very clever answer, I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that was very essential, I think, in, in the cause. Because a lot of us get into all these, all these uh, especially people who work in multinationals, all these credit-taking fights. And sometimes you get to forget the actual cause or the reason why we're all doing this. And you end up in this very tight, you know, who's taking the credit and, you know, I'm going to stop him because that's, that's not going to happen and so on. It, it was quite, quite a great uh, uh, experience I went through. And um, one of the great moments that working with people I didn't know, and after 10 days of starting the page, I got this guy who said, I want to be the English app. You know, I want to create another version of the page called We Are All Khaled Saeed in English. Um, and he emailed me from uh, an email. I used El Shahid as E L S H A E E E D. I found out that he has an email A L S H. So I told him, "Who are you? I need to know who are you." He said, "No, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to reveal my real identity. And since you are not revealing your your identity, and we kept working together for months uh, until the revolution happened, and I never knew who is he, and he never knew who I <laughs> who I was. And after the revolution, 
I, you know, I sent him an email. Now, as, as you know who I am, I need to know who are you. It turns out that he's an Egyptian living in the UK. Okay. So this page actually ends up becoming an organizing place. And <clears throat> I think before sort of January 25th, there were sort of some smaller demonstrations that, orga that began actually on the page. So, so and I, you were sort of quietly allowing the people on the page, though, to sort of help do this. Well, I wouldn't say I was allowing the people. Probably now I can, I can claim that. But the fact is, uh, the page was, ma I'm, I'm an apolitical mainstream person. I don't like confrontations. I'm intimidated by fear, as just like as everyone in, in, in the country, everyone mainstream in the country. I'm not as brave as those who are in the front lines saying down, down, Hosni Mubarak from 2005, uh, I would have never done that. Um, and when the page was created, I've learned something throughout my whole career is engaging everyone is important. And I looked at this, that this should not be the place where activists go. We have so many places where activists can go, on online and offline, and they meet with each other. They're, you know, they are on a certain level of understanding that is probably, there's a huge gap between the mainstream and the activists. So engaging was essential, and I thought of uh, our role, me and the other admin, as editors-in-chief. We just organize things. We don't, we don't tell people what to do. Rather, we ask them, should we do it? And if the majority say yes, then we do it. When we want to come up with ideas, we solicit ideas from the members, and the members come up with these ideas, and we channeled them back to the people to vote on which ones that make sense for them to happen. And that created a sense of ownership. So one guy, um, I had a, you know, I was completely against protests because I did not want to put the page members into any sort of risk, especially I am in Dubai. I cannot put people on the, it's, it's, um, it's not something nice to, to do, to expose others to risk while you're enjoying your safety back home in Dubai. Um, so uh, this guy came up with an idea where, which he sent by emails, let's go to the, let's get, tell everyone to dress in black and go to the street, face the beach, they're back to the streets and stand up for one hour and do nothing and just go back home. Um, and uh, the idea was when I saw, when the, the moment I read his email, I started to visualize it. It looks very nice. Uh, if you can manage to get people to do that, and you create the right uh, environment for it and the right PR for it, and you take back the photos from offline to bring it online, it will create a lot of impact on people. And so it happened and thousands of people took to the streets and we did it, we repeated it many times. Um, and that was kind of um, important in, in building the brand of the page. People liked the page because it wasn't, it was always mainstream. It wasn't, uh, it drew its own red line while the fact is, it was, it could have been easily, there, there could have been easily no red lines because I'm anonymous and no one is going to find out who I am. But the red lines did help in making sure that everyone is engaged and there is a comfort zone that most of the people get in. And, and these are basically the lessons I've learned the hard way uh, mm. through the page and reading the comments and understanding what people think. And that's why I wanted to share those stories uh, because those are, I think, away from the, uh, um, what happens as, or you know, the memoir part of it, but those are the lessons I've learned through the experience I went through. Mm. So you did this smaller demonstration, which yeah, everybody agreed was a good idea. And it is interesting because you were always extremely uh, careful not to be terribly political on the page. You even, when the Tunisian revolution began, you sort of made a decision, we're not really going to talk about it on the page until it was a success. And then you, you sort of decided, okay, I, I think we're going to follow this and talk about it. Yeah, I was, um, Abdurrahman, the other admin, happens to be an activist. So there was a very interesting balance and fights happening all, you know, all the time about he wants to go to push forward, I want to push back and uh, I think a few days right after Tunisia started to take off and no one at that time thought it was a revolution. It was a lot of protests and for the first time, I mean Tunisia, is, the, the regime there was, was very, the security was very tightened. Um, 
So he wanted to start talking about Tunisia, and I said, absolutely not, uh, because we do not want to disappoint people. I remember one, one uh, comment on the page that was posted, I think, on December or November, uh, as part of you know, a response to a post that he said, I wished I would have never joined this page because it was, you know, ignorance was a virtue. I, was, I did not know a lot of what was happening in, in this country and now as I know and I can't do anything about it, I'm, you know, I feel very disappointed and frustrated. So we did not need one more major frustration by talking about what happens in Tunisia as if we're saying, look at these great people and then it ends up with the police state crushing them. Um, and what happened on the 13th to me was uh, mind blowing. I, as an individual, as someone who's non-confrontational, apolitical, I looked at it and I was like, wow, for the first time since I was born, I see a president and our president apologizing to the people. It never happened before. He was saying, I'm sorry, I understood you and he appeared very weak, and, uh, and I saw the power of people in, in, in his speech. Um, and a lot of Egyptians at the time started like, you know, looking, what's going on there? What's happening? Um, and I believe uh, thousands of Egyptians were running this by their minds. Probably we should do the same thing. Uh, I created a vote on the page, should we discuss Tunisia or not? Uh, because I, di I did want this to be a popular vote, so over 70% said yes. And uh, I started discussing Tunisia, and, uh, and when he traveled, uh, when he escaped to Saudi Arabia, uh, that was the other str very strong moment, and Egyptians uh, think that they uh, are the leaders. They have this pride that they are the leaders of the Arab world, pretty much. Um, and they are the, uh, the ones that move and shake the region. So there was this sense of competition. Uh, it always happened before in, in soccer, and for the first time, <laughs> it's, it's like in, uh, for the first time we feel it's, it's more about politics. Um, people started to crack jokes uh, that, you know, Egyptians are not gonna do anything, and if, if, if Boazizi burned himself, set himself on fire in, in, uh, in Egypt, the admin of Kulina Khaled Said would have done a silent stand, saying that we are very reactive and and irresponsive and we're not up to a revolution and reading the comments I started looking at this the, and, and Twitter feed as well that you know looks like people want this to happen and few days before that Abdurrahman was uh, was telling me that we should do something on the police day on 25th and we thought of silent stands and we created a small event we wanted to do wall of shame and wall of fame for the police officers so um, and why the 25th it's the police day. It's, it was just, um, it just happened to, to be the police day and it was the, fir the, very mean the first meaningful day right after Ben Ali uh, uh -huh. stepped down. And uh, I just wrote... And the, I'm sorry, the police day is like a day when... It's, it's a celebration actually for, for uh, the police in, uh, in Ismailia um, in 1952. They were protecting, they, they joined the army in protecting, uh, um, uh, protecting Ismailia against the, the British, uh, I see. Uh, British army. So it had this great symbolism yeah. to it. Yeah, I yeah see. but um, <clears throat> of course the police force was, was no way close to those great guys who, uh, uh, who were there in, in 1952. Um, so, basically, I wrote on the page, and that's one thing you will see when you read the book about everything was being very spontaneous and the, fee the innocent feedback does play a big role in, in how this whole thing developed. I wrote that today is 14th and in 10 days we have a police day. And if 100,000 of us take to the streets, no one is going to stop us, referring to, uh, um, um, you know, Mubarak and we can pretty much do the same thing. And the feedback was very positive. There were, you know, skeptical people right. or people who think we are, you know, this is a, this page is managed from outside Egypt to destabilize the country. Um, yet, I just kept looking at what was going on and I was like, okay, I'm gonna dis change the name of the event on Facebook uh, from celebration of the police day. And celebration here was very sarcastic. It was right. not really a celebration. Uh, to revolution, uh, revolution on, um, uh, uh, on poverty, uh, unemployment, uh, corruption and torture. And 
that, that was like, okay, that's the moment where we are all ready to sacrifice our lives. We're going into a revolution. For some people, that was very funny. You know, you decide on uh, starting a revolution, creating an event on Facebook, deciding on the date, <laughs> the time, and location, telling the regime, okay, we are going to go there, and you expect it to happen. So uh, there were lots of people cracking jokes about, uh, about the event, and um, the next day, the anonymity played a big part of it, uh, since it, was, it wasn't personalized to anyone. A lot of people started to adopt it. A lot of movements, a lot of individuals, uh, politicians, started to talk about what can we do on Jan 25th. The regime completely said, you know, Egypt is not Tunisia, and that, that was their official response. Um, yet, I would say the 10 days were the best marketing campaign that happened in the country. Uh, because everyone was using their creativity to do something. I remember one guy wrote a resignation letter uh, on behalf of Hosni Mubarak, and um, he sent me the, the design and said, it's only missing one thing, his signature. Uh, it was basically saying that I apologize for what happened, and because of all of you took to the streets, I'm going to step down. It was inspired by the speech of uh, Ben Ali. Others started to create designs for flyers, banners, logos, and um, uh, people were writing uh, uh, po um, articles about uh, you know, encouraging each other to go. And the event was benefiting. Um, it was the central page where most of the people went to, the event page. And by just before the 25th of January, it had reached 1 million Egyptians on Facebook. And uh, over 100,000 have confirmed. Wow. And, uh, you know, you, you are the sort of accidental revolutionary here. You, you I'm still, of, I think. You know, yeah, you kind of uh, slid into this. Now, I know, uh, I mean, I think people here know you, you actually went back to Egypt for the demonstration. You were arrested. You spent uh, 11 days and miserable days in detention um, and sort of came out uh, of uh, prison uh, a celebrity. People knew who was behind the page. Um, and you did become, for, for a bit, uh, and I guess in some ways still are, a kind of spokesperson for the revolution. Though you have continued, I think, to sort That's of what say... That's you think. You have, well, I think you, have, you, you keep deflecting that idea, and you've kind of stuck to that. Uh, and um, at one point, I think you said to, to CNN, uh, ask Facebook, you know, if you want to know what's going to happen. Next. Oh, the, that was um, kind of uh, when he asked me what, what should, w which uh, which country uh, uh, is gonna, you know, wh which uh -huh. which country is gonna have a revolution next. I said, ask Facebook, and people thought by then I'm saying Facebook is, uh, uh, it's it's the Facebook revolution. I just meant that the sentiment of anger can be easily, if if there is a way of where I can sniff all everyone's uh, uh, phone calls, for example, you can tell, who, you know, when it's angry and people want uh, want to have change. And by the way, the Syrian revolution started on Facebook with a Facebook page and event. Uh -huh. Probably, you know, later and God willing, when when things get better, we will find out who uh, 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 who started that page and what happened to him and. Uh, uh, but the event was decided uh, using Facebook. And even in, in Libya, people agreed to start. It, the, the very first spark, and this is very important for uh, a statement to make, because I hear a lot about the power of social media. I think it was the power of the people and not the power of the social media. And I think the revolution was on the street and not online. Uh, what did the, the online helped in, in basically agreeing and collaborating and deciding that we're going to protest on Jan 25th, and because of that succeeded, the whole revolution happened. Yet, internet played a role in just, you know, uh, uh, disseminating information, uh, letting people know what's going on on the ground, the reality going on on the ground, and, uh, and you know, did definitely play part of a role in campaigning for more people to join. Yet, you cannot give the credit to the internet. Internet is just a communication tool, and, and there should be no Facebook revolutions because we never heard of the phone revolution. Every revolution is a people revolution and not a communication tool revolution. I guess, I guess people wonder if it wasn't for the fact, maybe what people mean often is, if it wasn't for the fact that this media existed and allowed people to interact together, because it's very hard to, for lots of different people to interact 
uh, in one place in the physical space, but online we can come together and discuss opinions and realize, oh, you know, you feel that way, I feel this way too, and in a way, um, these tools, while all the sentiment was there and all the people came out, it was because they could talk to each other. Well, I agree, but a hundred years ago there, there wasn't all these tools and people were still right. able to carry on revolutions. And I think that it, it just made it easier for, um, for us to communicate and collaborate. Uh, would have a revolution have happened without it? Definitely. Absolutely, it would have happened because anyway the the regime was going from bad to worse and people were in in 2010 almost 1000 protests took place uh, by workers uh, who were unhappy with their uh, economical conditions um, and uh, and that was it, it was coming the internet came in probably you know we can argue about it it accelerated it or gave it a s style or set it in a, in a certain direction, made it leaderless, probably, uh, yet tools are tools at the end of the day. It, what matters is how people use these tools, and, and the, you know, the, the credit should go to those who are you know, uh, courageous, who brave, who went to the, took to the streets. Some of them have died, others were injured, and uh, many have suffered, many lost their jobs. The, you know, we should talk more about the personal experiences of these people, and, and discuss how did these people revolt more than, you know, how, you know, what, what were the tools they were using? Well, I actually, one, uh, one thing I've heard people say, actually, is that the sort of more liberal activists were so busy organizing online, whereas the Muslim Brotherhood had been out and about um, on the ground organizing with people, and you sort of saw this in the elections in terms of their success. And I wonder, you know, uh, you, I'm sure you've heard people say uh, that, you know, particular Well, I don't criticism. think it's necessarily, I mean, most of the, what we call now liberals. Before, by the way, before the revolution, we hardly heard the world uh, <laughs> liberals. And now it's like a way to classify there, it's a Western been, term. Yeah, right. there's been a lot of classifications of the Egyptians, and uh, I, I like one of my friends who said that most of the Egyptians are the same. There's just one very thin layer on top of them that you know they like to classify themselves with. But culturally, we are we're very uh, we have a lot of common values. Um, so the thing is, political organization uh, is different than mobilization, and you can mobilize online and. Uh, which is something we have seen, but when it comes to politics, uh, political organizations, and in, in order to, to win in, in elections, you have to have a ground base. And the activists uh, did not take to the streets because they thought they are of a better option than Mubarak. Uh, I took to the street because I thought Egyptians have been denied the right to vote for 60 years and choose whomever comes in power. And it's about time they, uh, they have the, you know, they choose. And they chose among from from the various alternatives available for them which i'm very happy with whatever the outcome is as far as this is coming through a democratic process and in a few years if uh, those who are elected will not perform well then it's gonna the people are gonna be basically you know now as they are empowered and they are following them up and they're knowing what they're doing they know they are the ones who brought their chairs brought them to power they're gonna judge on their performance and it, whether, whether they, they you know, select them or, or decide not to. And um, if, if we just kind of uh, have the skepticism uh, uh, about the Muslim Brotherhood as, as so many you know, people in the West have been talking to me about, um, you know, the, the only thing I say, you know, so what do you think we should do? I think we should bring Mubarak back so that you guys will be happy and, and we, we enjoy it. And uh, that, that's, that argument doesn't work. Egyptians are not ready for democracy. They are going to choose whomever I don't want them to choose. But who said that this is democracy? Uh, if they were not ready for democracy, it's because there has been a dictatorship for over 30 years in the country. And that got to stop. Well, the Muslim Brotherhood says it believes in democracy. Do you believe that they believe in democracy? And that, in fact, if they are not successful, at governing that they will allow for I, I believe they should be given their their uh, now as people have uh, elected them 
uh, and they want them to be in power. I believe, as, as an Egyptian, I respect the people's choice, and I believe they, are, they should be given the, you know, the right to govern the country. And my job is not to judge on their intentions. Now they are in, in power. Soon they are going to have, they're going to be in action, and I will look at what, uh, what they're going to do. And as an Egyptian, as someone who loves this country, what I want to make sure is there is no reproduction of dictatorship at, uh, in, in any form. And this is what I'm only fighting. Other than that, I will help anyone who is democratically elected. I mean, I, I have to ask you a little bit about what's sort of unfolding at the moment uh, with these NGOs. You, and you yourself are actually about to start an NGO. Uh, uh, there are sort of these Americans who have been, you know, charged and um, I looked at it, and after, actually after reading your book, where you, you sort of talk a lot about how the army and the government kept saying, these are foreigners who are coming into our country and trying to manipulate us, and I wondered if this was an extension of that, and if you had any sense of what this is about. So, um, in Egypt, uh, before the revolution, the civil society was uh, sort of under the complete uh, um, you know, control of the government. Uh, and in fact, that, uh, for example, I am part of a political lobbying group now, which we just formed about a month ago, and practically speaking, according to the Egyptian law, it's illegal. Uh, I could be arrested <laughs> for being part of a political lobbying group that doesn't have a legal form, simply because there is no legal form for such a political lobbying group to exist. And this is one thing that need to change um, uh, after a while. What's happening now, I believe, has to do with the situation in Egypt is very fluid and there are lots of events taking place um, with a lot of people not understanding why they're happening. For example, the stadium event um, where over 70 people were killed. No one understands. This has never been Egypt. No one understands how could you know, a group of people go and attack others and, and kill 70 people. Um, and because of this situation, there are sort of, you know, like lack of trust and misunderstanding among the different parties, uh, you know, as uh, ISCAF or the revolutionaries or the Muslim brother. Everyone is sort of like looking at the problem from a different angle. Um, so, for example, this case of the, of the NGOs could be, trans, you know, translated in, in this. The R, there are sort of this whole conspiracy. I, well, part of my in, interrogations is that uh, when, when they were interrogating me, they said that I am uh, I'm hired by the CIA uh, to plot, the, you know, to, to destabilize Egypt, and uh, that I explained that in the book in, in full details. Um, and I was like, I can't believe this. He's basically saying I'm a traitor to my country. I, I don't, you know, I don't make the connection. And I, my answer was like, I love my country. I'm never, I'm never gonna get involved in, in any business that would, in my, you know that would make me uh, uh, basically favor the interests of any other country or any other organization against my country. But that didn't really work for them. I think the events that took place, the, un the events that unfolded and that are you know, happening now made a lot of people believe a lot in the conspiracy. But as, as someone who is inside this, I, I look sometimes and say we have to have a lot of patience and we have to have, um, uh, to have an optimistic view and s keep looking at what should happen, uh, not what is just happening, because by being reactive, you're not going to help in making, making the right future. So I'm hoping that things will stabilize in the next few months. Uh, I'm hoping that I'm working with, with so many Egyptians, not just me, to make sure that uh, the transition of power is going to happen through, uh, through presidential elections so that finally the Egyptian has, uh, uh, has the executive power in Egypt for the first time in 60 years is on the hand of someone that the people said we trust him for that. Do, do you think, I'm just curious in terms of that, tradition, that transition, do you think having those groups sort of pushed out will actually be harmful? Were they helping? Um, bring democracy about on the well, ground? Well, the, the impact of NGOs uh, in, in the revolution, I think, again, I, I will speak from my own experience, which is very limited, I have to say. And one, one reason why I wrote the book is uh, uh, because this was a leaderless movement. Everyone was exposed to a certain view of the events, and uh, to, according to my knowledge, the knowledge that I know, I don't think 
uh, uh, those uh, NGOs did play a big role. Probably the human rights NGOs uh, were definitely helping even before the revolution and exposes, uh, exposing the case of uh, torture and so on. But the democracy-based groups, uh, I'm not sure if they play the critical role or, or if, even if, uh, if any role in, the, uh, in what happened and what is happening in Egypt. Do you think that, you know, as you move forward now, that social media is going to play an important role in an ongoing way? Or, I mean, alternatively, it could also be used and has mm. been used, for example, in China to sort of catch people or, or to, you know, uh, in rather authoritarian ways. And probably a, a professor at Harvard or Stanford would, would answer that question looking forward. For, for me, I will do what I've got to do, and uh, um, which is that I will use any tools that, uh, that are available to communicate with the people and try and convince them that Egypt needs to change and that we are still undergoing the change and that the revolution is still unfinished and it will only be finished when we are, you know, we are on the right track and we achieve most of the demands of the, uh, uh, of the revolution. And I think social media, just like, again, most of other, uh, most of other communication tools, uh, uh, still playing a role. I mean, people are agreeing on ideas online and taking them offline. This happened all over the place. And mostly now our government is, is all over Facebook. We are the, you know, the only country where the Supreme Council of Armed Forces have a, uh, you know, an official Facebook fan page. <laughs> and they're, uh, yeah, it's, it's not funny, that's the reality. Well, and you wonder why they call it the uh, Facebook actually, there revolution. Actually, there is one of the, one of the official, uh, one time I, I was telling my friends, like, wow, our history books are going to look very uh, strange. Because, for example, one official statement uh, on, uh, on, on the f uh, on SCAF uh, fan page was like, this is the only official page uh, for SCAF, and this is the only place where, you know, everyone should be notified of, uh, of our official statements. Because they, when they release their statements, it only goes to Facebook. They only publish it on their fan page. And, uh, and rest, many others, uh, uh, many other government agencies are using it. Would I... You may be ahead of the United States on a lot of this stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so would I, would I be uh, afraid that the technology would be used in, in the wrong way? I, I don't know. I mean, for me, that's a, I will use it in a good way, and I will make sure that what I, what I do is, is bringing value to the country. I'll make sure that uh, uh, also uh, that I won't deceive the people. And the wisdom of the crowds many times play a, a big role. If you, if you wrote something and it's not, if it's not real, you will be grilled in comments and people are going to expose. And, and, and that's, that's the good thing about it. There, there isn't a single point of power. Um, the, the concept of mainstream media is being decentralized now. Uh, individuals are empowered to create a video and have 200,000 people just sit down and watch it in, in, uh, in 24 hours. In the past, that wasn't the case. And this is definitely kind of bringing um, a, a, better, a better world in, in the sense of the, you know, the, the, the conclusions that we will draw are going to be based on so many factors and so many ideas coming on all together. I know um, we want to open up to some questions from the audience now. Um, and I think we have people wandering around or someone wandering around with a microphone. So if people have questions for Wael, um, the mic is there. Um, I see we have a hand over here. Oh, OK. We have. Should I go first? What? Sorry. You have. Well, thank uh, you for coming. Hello, by the way. Uh, my question for you is, uh, in creating Egypt's new democracy, uh, do you see yourself creating a constitutional democracy, something that's structured? And where do you see that occurring, and how long will it take before that actually does occur? Well, uh, again, that's a, that's a very tough question for an ordinary guy like me. I'm hoping for, um, for definitely having a structured democracy. When we established the, the political lobbying group, which by the way has two professors of uh, political science because we needed, we needed that kind of help. Uh, we were thinking that we should do our share of the democratization of the country. We need the lobbying group uh, because when you are not happy with something, 
it's not, you don't go and protest every time. You probably need to go and communicate with the parliament members, with the government, uh, and instead of just highlighting the problems, you probably need, want to propose solutions. Uh, so this is one way. Uh, I think the democratic process is gonna take time. It's not gonna happen in like this. Uh, and that was the case in, in, many, uh, in many countries, including the US. It, it, it just didn't, people just didn't sit down and agree that democracy is gonna be, you know, we're gonna start democracy tomorrow and that's it. It will take time, but the most important thing that I care about is that Egyptians, uh, um, you know, will not be scared again to speak up their minds. And the second, that we will make sure that a critical mass of Egyptians are politically engaged. Because if we have those two, uh, that will make sure that whomever is in power always thinking of what, what will the people think? Something that we have, we, we never had in, uh, in the past. And through that, we are just learning uh, uh, over time. I, I've learned to be very patient and not to g get easily burnt out in day-to-day in -day events and to look at things, try and look at the good sides of the story uh, and analyzing the bad sides so that it doesn't happen again. Another question here. Uh, Osher Yadgar from SRI and the Israeli newspaper Megaphone. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, how do you think the revolution and the rise of the Muslim brother, Brotherhood and the Salafic uh, movement, which controls 70% of the parliament right now, will affect the uh, relationship with Israel and the peace treaty? Okay, so uh, if you don't mind, please, this is not an official newspaper interview. Uh, and this applies for everyone. I, I told them that I don't want to, uh, to be speaking to media today. So um, I think that um, I, w I would quote Thomas Friedman on, uh, on, in one of his articles. He said that the time that you solve the problems with Egypt using phone calls is over. Uh, Egypt now is a country that where the people have chosen their leadership and there has to be um, you know, the, the, the opinions of the leaders have to s kind of reflect the opinions of the people. Uh, I believe also that the first priority in Egypt, and which is something we are all speaking about, is the economy. Uh, one out of every two Egyptians is basically uh, under, living under um, a poverty line. And I believe also that in, you know, in, in the next a few years, we're all going to be maturing, and uh, this is what we get from the democracy. I'm very happy, by the way, that uh, it's, you know the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis are now part of the uh, political uh, political game. Some people look at the Salafis and say they're used to say that uh, democracy is elite, you know, haram or you know unlawful, and how come they get in power? I'm looking at the bright side. All of a sudden, these people have changed their mind, and they decided on getting in the field. And the field, by the way, for a country like Egypt is full of problems and people are having very high expectations at the moment. They want to see their lives better. Next question. Hi. Um, so I have a uh, question about the criticisms that you faced um, from people. I was recently in the Middle East and um, I talked to some people that felt like maybe you got too much credit for what happened. Um, you were, I think, on the list of uh, Man of the Year for um, Yahoo Year in Review and a few other things. Um, so I'm curious how um, you dealt with that reaction and what sort of criticism you face. Uh, part two, um, how did Google support you and if they did at all sort of in this? I know in the beginning um, some of the developers created a hack for the Egyptians to tweet. Um, and just curious, since this was one of Google's biggest media stories of the year, um, how they sort of supported you or if they did at all. Thanks. Well, I agree with uh, what the people said about the credit. I unintentionally, it, it wasn't my my mistake to, uh, uh, to get all the credit, and I, I agree with them. Um, and I learned uh, over the past 12 months to uh, accept the fact that once you are exposed to a larger group than uh, your close friends, uh, you are gonna always see people who are not gonna be happy with what you say, or people who will question your intentions, or people who will, not, who will think that you're not genuine. And at the same time, you'll find people who will think that you are very genuine, and that will trust everything you say, and will be your fans. So uh, I'm, I'm learning uh, through the experience. Um, and I'm, what I'm trying to do is to satisfy no one but my, my, con you know, my, uh, uh, my heart. I'll do what my heart is telling me to do and, and uh, uh, kind of 
listen to the constructive feedback, listen to the constructive criticism, try and address the problems and, and the credit taking issue. I, I always mentioned it uh, uh, and I was not very happy with it and even most of those choices as whatever, it, it just happened. I, I don't go and submit an application and ask people please choose me or not. And I hope by reading the book people will, will exactly know uh, um, you know, that was not just me and I shouldn't be taking the credit. This was a collaborative work. I just happened to get all the spotlight after my release. And for uh, Google, Google did definitely help me uh, big time. During my arrest, they created uh, uh, a huge campaign, that campaign basically to find me. And um, I think it wasn't very typical for many companies. Uh, this, if, if the same situation happens for many companies, uh, that w probably that wouldn't be the reaction. And they even put uh, an ad on the homepage of, the, of Google in Egypt that to help them find, uh, to help, help find well the name, hire the company, uh, m multiple companies, local companies in Egypt to look after me in every morgue or uh, a hospital or police station, which is, something I highly appreciate of, of the company. Even their reaction after my release was, uh, was, very, uh, was very brief, especially that things didn't, you know, the, the result of the revolution was not obvious at the time. Um, I, I was released on the 8th. So I, I really thank Google for, for all what they, have, uh, uh, what they have done, and I think it's a great company. And one year tomorrow, right? Next question. Uh, hi. Um, in addition to some of the criticism that you got about maybe taking glory, you also were the object of quite a few conspiracy theories that circulated around Egypt, and it seemed like that was uh, that, that's part of the culture there. With every day, there's a different conspiracy theory. Um, so I, I asked, is do you see any generational differences in that and people's understanding of media and information and how media circulates there? And then the second part of that, if you could comment also on um, El Baradez stepping down and deciding not to run for president and if, uh, what your feelings are around that. Okay. So um, for, for the first question, I think the events that unfolded was, were huge beyond the imagination and expectation of everyone. And um, when, when something like that happens, it's very common that many people start looking at this and it's like, mm, you know what, probably that's, uh, you know, that, that cannot be just spontaneous. I mean, what I know is that, you know, I emailed one of the guys working on the ground on the 20th, fighting with him, saying, uh, you know, where are the locations? Uh, we cannot just, we're five days away and we cannot just tell people to keep waiting and we're lost. And that was just five days before. So there wasn't a conspiracy, and this is what I tell people. And I, I just think that anyone who wants to believe that this is a conspiracy is directly insulting the courage and, uh, um, and the amazing um, Egyptians who took to the street uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 25th of January and sacrificed everything for, to make this happen. Will, will there will be people believing in conspiracy no matter what you tell them? I think it's, uh, it's yes. I'll just tell them the facts and if they are happy to listen to it and believe in it, fine. If they don't, I mean, that doesn't change me from doing what I, what I want to keep doing. Uh, for al Baradi, I think that we, a lot of us were disappointed from his uh, withdrawal. I, we, we think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's his assessment uh, and you know he read the situation in a way probably different than uh, uh, than some of the people. Uh, but after all, what I like in him is what I ended chapter two with: If you think I am your savior, then you're wrong. The Egyptian people will save themselves. Nothing has changed since then. Next question. Um, I I'm very interested in the person, the most personal part of the story. And I, I note that you said the real revolutionaries were on the street, that you were not a real revolutionary in that sense. And you also commented that for quite a while you were protective of your own identity, that you were anonymous, right? You didn't want to be known. But at some point you became known. And I'm really curious from what you could tell us about that moment when you decided to put your, if not your life, your freedom on the line and expose yourself. 
I mean, I've been blessed to live in America for 70 years. I've never put my life on the line, never had to. Uh, and I'm really, really curious about that. If you could just, without being, you know, I know I can hear how humble you are, but I really would like to hear what it took. How did you come to that choice? What was it like? So, so actually, uh, it wasn't my choice. If, if it was my choice, I would have re re remained anonymous. Uh, when I was arrested, uh, they, I don't know till now the reason or, you know, the exact reason why did they arrest me and how, or how much did they know, did they know I was the admin of the page or not. Uh, but uh, during the interrogations, I told them, for obvious reasons, <laughs> um, uh, the, the truth. And um, there were few people that knew my real identity outside. And when I disappeared and Google started talking about me, those people started to get worried. Uh, I told uh, some Egyptian lady who lived in the US, uh, she knows who I was, that if, if I disappear, uh, get someone to keep updating the page and, uh, and do not say that I disappeared, hoping that I would not tell the, tell the authorities that I was the admin and they would, you know, I keep denying it, for example, and they would release me. But, you know, I was... Uh, they knew, I, right? Yeah. They no, knew. it's not they knew. They, when they asked me, I decided to say. Uh, the, the reception party worked very well. Um, <laughs> so my friends told newspapers uh, on, I believe, the 4th of February, which was a few days after my, uh, my arrest, that I was the admin. And uh, by the time I, I was out of prison, everyone knew. But uh, if, if, if I had the choice, I would have rena remained anonymous. Um, it, it would have been much, you know, <laughs> a, a better story, actually, uh, and, uh, and more genuine, and it wouldn't put, put me to the, you know, criticism of trying to take too much credit for, for something that was collective and millions of people participated in. And finally, it would have, uh, um, it would have made the page, you know, as powerful as it used to be. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it seems like in, in some ways I, I want to say it feels like the media has actually ha had a lot to do with the fact that you've gotten so much credit. I mean, media have a lot of, uh, they like, <laughs> a we, lot of things to do with a lot of things happening in this world. <laughs> I, think, I think they like to personalize. Well, when you yeah. personalize stories, it brings them home, so maybe that's part of it. Uh, next, next question. Hi, so I had a question about the organization of the demonstration itself on January 25th. I read one story that I never read confirmed anywhere else, and this might be common knowledge, but I haven't read enough to know. Um, what I read was that lots of smaller groups of protesters gathered and then made their way towards Tahrir Square, and the ones that made it were the ones that were not organized in the open. They were the ones that were organized um, at the street level through handbills and not through Facebook. So I was wondering if you could speak to the, the challenges of, of organizing a demonstration like that in the open and, and what you faced and what your experience with that was. Uh, actually, actually the, what happened on Jan 25th is that we agreed that uh, we agreed of meeting points and um, the activists would start uh, one hour before um, in poor areas, poor neighborhoods. Uh, why? Because we, we understand that many people would want to protest, but they, they are scared. They would, be, they would fear the consequences. So if, if you start from a poor neighborhood, large number of people calling everyone to join them. We had this chant, uh, join us, join us, you know, we are, uh, uh, you know, we want our freedom. And a lot of people started joining and joining, and they would meet in, for example, the, uh, there was one of the meeting points was Mustafa Mahmoud, and then a march happens from Mustafa Mahmoud to Tahrir. The marshes played a, an, 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 a magical, you know, played a magical role in, in, the, in the demonstration because marshes bring more and more people. If, if I look and wow, all these people, I'm going to join them. It, it made it was very convincing uh, for anyone who's scared. Because, uh, and, and when I went to Tahrir on Jan 25th, I felt very safe because all of a sudden I'm with all these people who are, uh, uh, who share the same thing I want, I want it to happen. It just gave us all the collective power uh, to, to keep going. Another question. Uh, it was very heartening <coughs> to see all the Egyptian women on the front lines, but uh, things seem to be changing and, uh, you know, 
what would you say the Egyptian women should do? How do they utilize their social media to get their rights back? Because it isn't freedom unless the entire population has all their freedoms and rights, right? So, okay, can you repeat the question again? Sorry. So uh, it was good to see the Egyptian women also fighting for mm -hmm. the revolution side by side with men. Uh, but it's, things seem to have taken a turn for the women with the current situation. And how do they mobilize the social media? Uh, are they fighting for their freedoms? And what do you think is the best solution? And also, I had a question with your NGO. Are you trying to do something for the women as well? Okay. Um, so for, for the women, I think it was, uh, it was one of the great things, uh, one of the great things in the revolution is that we've seen, you know, Tahrir Square was sort of a micro Egypt. You have the women, uh, the, the senior Egyptians, the poor, and the very rich. Everyone was in Tahrir Square. Um, yet the change to where we want to see, for example, women participation in politics, uh, I think this is something cultural that will take time to change. And even if you enforce it, uh, which is something that the you know, Mubarak uh, uh, regime tried to do, it, it becomes very superficial and it doesn't last uh, and, uh, and it, it doesn't just work this way. Um, I'm, I'm personally you know, grateful for all the uh, women who took, you know, took place in Tahrir and I, I, I would have loved to see more women in the parliament. The, parliament, the number of females in the parliament is, is very little in fact, uh, very disappointing. Um, but I can see that Women are very active in the society now, especially with, uh, with, uh, with politics. So we, we see a huge number of female activists taking place, you know, and taking a role in, uh, in, in what happens in the country. And just getting into politics is something that, that should evolve and happen. Just like as we say that the young Egyptians should sort of institutionalize what they were doing in the square and start getting involved in, in the politics and start participating and running for uh, uh, running for elections, even in, uh, in their lo local communities, uh, because the the field now is is getting open, is is becoming open for for everyone. So I'm optimistic about this, and it will take time, as as we just were talking about democracy taking time, and until it it, it is well established in the country. You have another question. And the good thing about social media it doesn't ask you if you are a female or a male before you do an action or create an event. Can, can, can you talk a little bit about the, the trust um, and distrust in sort of organizing online? It sounds like at, at once you were trying to keep anonymity with fellow organizers, but also you trusted them enough to work with them. And it seems in the offline organizing space, you see people, you hang out with them, you build social capital. When online, you know, you're just an avatar. So can you talk about how you built trust or how you felt people out or how you maybe didn't trust actually people? <coughs> I think it, it has to do with, um, uh, with your credibility. For example, the page had built uh, um, a good credibility over time. Um, whenever I would post some news story and I find out that it's, uh, it's wrong, I put an apology on the page and I don't regret saying I'm very sorry it was wrong. And um, whenever, uh, uh, whenever I accuse any, you know, anyone of doing something and it turns out that he's, he's, uh, he's not g guilty of it, I do the same thing. Um, I'm in inclusion and getting everyone working together. So credibility takes time. It's just like how you develop in the offline world. You know, I just don't see you. If you don't have a, a, a you know, historical record, I just don't see you and trust you. There has to be a, you know, sort of a transaction. The difference here is that the transaction that takes place takes place online. So um, in, in many cases, I, I worked with activists whom I know, they don't know me, but I know who are they, and I know where they come from. And that very, uh, uh, very special case of the English administration, his work would, was what I, you know, what I trusted. He created the page, I saw how is he posting, and I keep looking at it, and it looks like it's, uh, uh, it's just, you know, I, I followed my guts, basically, my gut on, on, on doing that. You know, I, one thing I know that was happening while you were organizing, you started to see posts and you grew suspicious that some of them were being planted by the government. Yeah. There was, you sort of had a, a gut about it. I'm, and um, 
So maybe there's something to that, that people start to have a gut about what's real, particularly younger people who are used to? Yeah, the, own, the EGOT. Kind of media, the, the EGOT, right. You, get it, you develop, if you're under 30, you develop an EGOT. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's the same thing as the offline. You know, we say that there's chemistry between individuals, and probably the same thing happens online. I don't think the, the, the online world is different than the offline world in, in many aspects, but people are, you know, probably more outspoken o online, and, you know, you tend to see the, you know, the, the real person uh, than, you know, when you see them offline. But other than that, most of, most of the relationship uh, uh, building happens online as they happen offline. The more I talk with a person, the more I like him, or I, I basically don't like him. The more I trust him, or I don't trust him. Yeah, I mean, because that's a t in China, having traveled there, I know they use this tactic where the government starts to go, you know, into chat rooms and plant things. Mm. And as far as I can tell, there's a lot that's very effective about the way China manipulates social media. Yeah, I mean, but that's, uh, we had that in Egypt, and uh, a lot of them were easy to find fake accounts. Uh, basically, accounts that were just created, they do nothing. They have, you know, three, four friends, and, right. and that's all about it. And all what they do is write on the page uh, stuff. But when you have a critical mass of people who really want change, you cannot create a critical mass of, uh, of those kind of people who would combat that change. Um, there were calls on uh, before Jan 25th not to, uh, not to go to the streets, uh, not to take to the streets, and it never worked, and people did take to the streets. Let's take a couple more questions. Hi, um, just wondering. So now Egypt is going through a huge democratic transition, and then like, you know, there are the optimists and the pessimists who think like, what will this be like about the new government, right? And then, do you think there's a pressure within like the Egyptian population, a pressure to like get things right, on, not only for Egypt itself, but there are other nations going through the same situ situation, revolutionary situation going through. So, do you think, do you see Egypt as bearing the pressure of getting things right and being like the role model for not only its nation, but also for rest of the Arab nations going through the same process? Yeah, I would, I, personally, I, I hope that happens because uh, I wish, you know, I wish to see the whole Arab, uh, Arab countries uh, going through real change. Whether it was through a revolution or not, this is up to the people to decide how, you know, every nation know exactly which state they are in and what are the needs. But what, as, as, young, uh, as young Arabs, uh, uh, we, you know, were born and, and probably were going to die <laughs> Uh, seeing one president or you know a couple couple of them, uh, if uh, if any you know if 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 the first dies, um, and that was that that did frustrate a lot of us. We we share a lot of common frustrations. And one thing even before the revolution, when Khaled Saeed died, uh, I remember a Tunisian page had a 1,000 uh, uh, fans on it. That was basically Tunisians calling for justice for Khaled Saeed. So. There is this uh, uh, virtual connections that is bringing um, um, different people from different parts of the world. That, this is not probably restricted to Arabs. It's, it's basically the human uh, uh, part inside all of us is, uh, can, can be seen here. So I wish to see change happening in, in the region. And I'm, uh, uh, I, I hope that in the next few years we will help each other solve the problems. I mean, Libya and Tunisia, Syria and Yemen, all these countries undertaking revolutions uh, should learn from each other and should help each other because the last thing we want, the last thing anyone who believe in democracy wants is one of these, you know, one of these uh, 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 revolutions fail. It just sends the, the best message for any dictator to tell his people, you know, see, look at these people, they made the revolution, they, out, they thought they were doing the right thing, but look at them after five years from now. Look what happens to them. And this is exactly what we don't want to see in our country. Yeah, I, actually on the way over here, I was hearing on the BBC some people in Tunisia who were not happy yet with where things were at, but you know, it hasn't been that long. I think we can take one more question. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, so uh, I have two questions, two quick questions, hopefully. Um, so I'm from the region, and I usually get that same question. Why, how come after Hosni Mubarak fell, um, 
it turned out to be, uh, it became a, a more Islamic revolution. And that was the kind of face because of all the elections that happened after. And um, I was wondering, um, I usually you know, answer that question because I think that maybe they're the most organized group. But however, I don't think Egyptians are um, really that religious. So I'm wondering why, why it went that direction. And then the second question is, um, you, I, I realize that you don't have aspiration of being uh, invol too, too involved in politics, but um, you are the face of the revolution, whether you like it or not. Um, but um, she's going to respond back. <laughs> to you about that. Do, do, you, do you see yourself in the future maybe getting a little bit more involved because I think the region and the country could benefit from fresh views like yours? Okay. So um, I think that I've answered the first question in, uh, in when I was speaking, when I said that we took to the streets not to tell Egyptians what they should, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, people they should elect or the, the identity. Uh, we took to the streets because these people were denied the right to vote. And, um, and by the way, the exact, argument that was that was the exact argument used by Hosni Mubarak if there is real demo he, he kept telling the West if uh, there is democracy the Muslim Brotherhood are gonna come in power so what is the what is the solution let's keep in you know having this dictatorship convincing ourselves that this is a stability and it turns out that this was very short-sighted because it, it wasn't you know it, it only it was only maintained for so many years but then now things uh, flipped aside and I have to say that big, you know, big part of why people have voted for the Muslim Brotherhood is because of their organization and because of their, um, people are sick of corruption in this country. Uh, they have seen the resources of the country drained for so many years, stolen by people. There was, you know, I mean, there is still corruption at basically all levels. And they wanted to see a completely new flavor of uh, people bringing in uh, uh, more of a, uh, uh, you know, credibility and, you know, belief that they are not going to be as corrupt. And largely, Egyptians want, uh, are, are not anarchists, they don't like anarchy, they don't want to see things flipped upside down. In fact, most of uh, our revolutions, I was reading a book that was saying that most of Egyptian revolutions were actually uprisings and not revolutions. And, you know, the people can debate the differences. Um, so, people want, at the end of the day, to make sure that the country is in the hands of people who are organized, uh, who know what they're doing, who exist everywhere, and, uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood pretty much uh, um, fulfilled this. And I think that Egyptian, you know, it depends on how you define religious, but to a large extent, I believe, majority of the Egyptians are religious, as in they have a great respect of, uh, of religion. And this, these are not my words or my, I mean, Gallup, I believe, made a survey I mentioned in the book where the said that over 90% of Egyptians think that religion is, is something very important in their own lives. Um, so what matters, again, is all, not all these speculations or what will they do. What matters is our job is basically, I would say, to help them if they are bringing real democracy, if they're making real change, if they are helping the poor, because that's the lo biggest violation of human rights. When you see a guy who's sleeping on the, uh, 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 on the floor for three months because he cannot afford uh, to get his broken leg fixed, I believe this is a human right violation because this guy, if he is in a, in a democratic country, should have the right to be able to get the medication that would make him just like me walking in the street and finding a job. So if they are going to help those people um, overcome these challenges, I'm, I'm the first one to help them. I want Egypt to change and that will be by bringing by working all together and by bringing everyone to the table in solving the problems. And uh, I believe a lot of us will mature over the next few years. We'll mature our vision about you know, the differences in the country. There are many countries where we have Christians, you know, religious Christians in, in either power or have a strong political participation. That doesn't, you know, it's, it's pretty much the, the, the same thing. What matters at the end, is there a democratic process? Is there an exchange of power? Uh, is there, you know, uh, um, independent uh, uh, systems running the country? We don't want, uh, as I said, another form of dictatorship, and this is what we are fighting. Other than this, we have to accept whomever people, Egyptian people chose. Great. Well, um, I want to thank the Churchill Club for organizing this conversation, and I want to thank Wael Gunn. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Thanks.
And on behalf of the Churchill Club audience, I'd also like to thank Weil and Laura for this remarkable conversation. Uh, thanks again to Google for making this program possible. And Weil's book, Revolution 2.0, is available for purchase tonight, courtesy of Books, Inc. And Weil has graciously agreed to stick around for a little while and sign copies. And a friendly reminder that no photographing, audio taping, or videotaping is permitted, and we do appreciate your cooperation on that. Uh, Revolution 2.0 is also available in an audio version on audible.com. And you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Have a good night. I hope I didn't take you back to history too much. <laughs>